When I was just a little fella, I used to love to ride around on my dad's shoulders. I felt like I was on top of the world. I was so high up. Now, the truth is, I was really not that high up. My dad is not a particularly tall man. But at three or four years old, that felt really high up. When I was nine or ten, I took a fall off a rooftop. Now, that felt like a really long fall, like I had been way up high. And I got bruised, and I got banged up, but I healed up just fine. When I was about 13 or 14, I learned what really high up meant. On a family vacation, we went to Royal Gorge Bridge. It's one of the highest bridges in the country. The drop is almost 1,000 feet. And standing there on the edge of that 1,000-foot drop, looking down, looking over the edge, I really understand what a long fall would be like. In life, sometimes we face a rough time, a struggle, a conflict, a difficulty, and we think we know what suffering means. Then maybe God shows us that we were not as high up as we thought, and he lets us fall a little further, and then he catches us. I believe that God uses the bumps and bruises we get in this life to help us understand our need for him, to help us understand our eternal position. Every single human being is actually standing on the edge of a thousand foot drop. And we are given a choice. We can trust in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross, or we can trust in ourselves. If we trust in Christ, we are lifted high above that thousand foot drop. If we reject Jesus Christ, then we take that long fall all by ourselves. Today, we're going to look at the final chapter of the book of Joel. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to Joel chapter 3. I'll be beginning in verse 1. These verses are also found in your bulletins. Throughout this book, Joel has been talking about three events. A locust plague during his own lifetime. A coming invasion and exile of the Jewish people to Babylon and the final judgment, the great and awesome day of the Lord. In this last chapter, he's going to focus on that last event, the great and awesome, terrible day of the Lord. Joel chapter 3, starting in verse 1. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Then I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my inheritance Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, and they have divided up my land. They've also cast lots for my people, traded a boy for a harlot, and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. Moreover, what are you to me, Tyre and Sidon, and all the regions of Philistia? Are you rendering me a recompense? But if you do recompense me swiftly and speedily, I will return your recompense on your head. Since you have taken my silver and my gold and brought my precious treasures to your temples and sold the sons of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks in order to remove them far from their territory, Behold, I'm going to arouse them from the place where you have sold them and return your recompense on your head. Also, I will sell your sons and daughters into the hand of the sons of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabians, to a distant nation, for the Lord has spoken. Now, at the beginning of this chapter, Joel says, in those days and at that time. So when is Joel talking about? Well, I believe Joel must be talking about the events of the final judgment. I think we can know this because he says God will restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. And that phrase, restore the fortunes, that's talking about more than just making things physically better or socially better or economically better. That phrase, restore the fortunes, means to fully restore Jerusalem and Judah. Jesus is going to reign from a fully restored Jerusalem. For a thousand years. This is the Jerusalem Joel is describing. Now, the people Joel is writing to have just been through a very tough time. Locust, plague, drought, and fire. And they're about to go through an even tougher time with an invasion by a massive army and an exile. And at the final judgment, many of them 
and will face something far worse than invasion and exile. But God is going to restore the land after the locusts. And God is going to restore the nation of Israel after the exile. And God will fully restore Jerusalem and Judea as part of the final judgment. And Christ will rule the world from a fully restored Jerusalem for a thousand years. This final judgment will be a judgment on all the nations of the world. Joel says God is going to gather all the nations. He'll bring them to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Now that name, Jehoshaphat, means God judges. So this is literally the valley in which God judges. There's some question, though, about where this valley is. Currently, at the time Joel wrote this, there was no valley called Jehoshaphat. Right now, we know of no valley called Jehoshaphat. It is possible that this valley will actually be created when Christ returns and appears on the Mount of Olives, this is described in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. In that day, his, Jesus' feet, will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in the front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley, so that half of the mountain will move towards the north and the other half towards the south. It's possible that that is a description of the valley of Jehoshaphat being created. The point is not really where this valley is or which valley is or when it comes about. The point is what's going to happen in the valley. God will enter into judgment of the nations. Part of what these nations will be judged for is how they have treated the people of Israel. Throughout history, many nations have treated the people of Israel badly. Many nations have divided up their land. Many nations have abused the Jewish people. And here at this judgment, part of what the people of the world will be condemned for is how they have treated God's chosen people. Now, this is not the only thing folks are going to be judged for. All of judgment, every action taken will be judged. But I think the reason Joel focuses on this part of the judgment is who he's writing to. The folks he's writing to need to know that the things they have suffered and the things they're going to suffer, God is going to judge those people that have done them. This judgment will be for everyone who has rejected Jesus Christ. Now, there is some question about when this judgment happens. There's books written arguing about it happens here, it happens here. I think it's most likely that this judgment comes at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ. If somebody wants to argue with me, I'll discuss it with them. It's not a big deal. It's not really about when. The key is understanding the inevitability of this, the certainty of this, that it is absolutely going to happen. We need to understand that this judgment is coming. Understanding that this judgment is certain, this judgment is absolute, that this judgment is definitely coming is something that should help us with two things. First, understanding that this judgment is certain should help us with the injustice we see in the world. We need to know that no one gets away with any injustice. Sometimes in this life it may look like folks get away with things, those folks may even think they get away with things. But absolutely everyone who treats other people unjustly will face God one way or another. Second, this judgment should help us understand our dire need for a Savior. Absolutely none of us have led a perfect life. Every single one of us is going to stand before God. All of us need the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ to pay for our sins. We will all stand before God. The question isn't, are you going to stand before God? The question is, will you stand before him at the valley of Jehoshaphat, alone, without the blood of Christ to cover your sins? Or will you stand before him at the Bema seat as one of his children covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. One way or the other, we will all be called to stand before him. Joel chapter 3, starting in verse 9. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare a war. 
Rouse the mighty men. Let all the soldiers draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am a mighty man. Hasten and come, all you surrounding nations, and gather yourselves there. Bring down, O Lord, your mighty ones. Let the nations be aroused and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. God instructs Joel to tell the nations to prepare for a war, to get ready. They're to call out their greatest warriors. All their troops are to come to the fight. Even the weak are called into battle. They're to turn their farming tools into weapons. And they're to do all of this for a war they cannot win. Notice what Joel says at the end of verse 11. This is a very brief but very powerful prayer. He says, bring down, O Lord, your mighty ones. God has called all the nations to come out. God has said, bring your warriors. Put together all the weapons you've got. The nations can gather all the troops they want. They can make as many weapons as they want. But God is about to bring down his mighty ones. That is the angelic hosts, the armies of God. It doesn't matter how many soldiers you bring. It doesn't matter how prepared you are. It doesn't matter what weapons you've got. The outcome of this battle is so certain that the battle is not even discussed. Joel jumps straight to the results, the outcome of the battle. The nations will come to the valley of God judges, and this judgment will be very severe. Joel says God will put in the sickle or pruning knife. The harvest is ripe. The fruit is ready. God will come tread the grapes from the harvest for the wine press is full and the vats overflow. He describes the wickedness of the nations as being great. You see, the truth here is that God and his angelic hosts are harvesting sinners. That's what they're there to do. That's what this judgment is all about. And Joel tells us the size of the harvest. He says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. That word multitudes means more than you can possibly count. And when it stacks it up like that, it means more than you can possibly count multiplied by more than you can possibly count. This in the Hebrew mind is the biggest number you can imagine, bigger than we can think of. And when he calls this place the Valley of Decision, another way to translate that would be the Valley of the Verdict. See, the decision has already been made. It's not like God is going to decide while he's standing there. This is the valley of the verdict. The decision being made here has already been done. This verdict has been passed on all those who have rejected Jesus Christ as Savior. Joel chapter 3, starting in verse 15. The sun and the moon grow dark, and the stars lose their brightness. The Lord roars from Zion and utters His voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth tremble. But the Lord is a refuge for his people and a stronghold to the sons of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. So Jerusalem will be holy and strangers will pass through it no more. And in that day, the mountains will drip with sweet wine and the hills will flow with milk and all the brooks of Judah will flow with water. And a spring will go out from the house of the Lord to water the valley of Shittim. Egypt will become a waste and Edom will become a desolate wilderness because of the violence done to the sons of Judah in whose land they have shed innocent blood. But Judah 
will be inhabited forever and Jerusalem for all generations. And I will avenge their blood, which I have not avenged, for the Lord dwells in Zion. And Joel is talking about God pronouncing this judgment. He says the sun and the moon grow dark, the stars dim, and God roars his judgment from Jerusalem. And as a result of God roaring his judgment from Jerusalem, the heavens and the earth tremble. Think about that for a minute. That's a powerful image. Can you imagine being there when this happens? God roars his judgment from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth tremble. But, and see this is the important part here, but God is a refuge, a safe place for his people. I don't know if you've ever been in an earthquake. We were never in a major one, but we lived in California for a while, and I've been in little teeny tiny ones. And what you're looking for at that moment when the heavens and the earth tremble is a safe place, a refuge. That's what you want, and that's what God is. And the result of this safety of God being a refuge, a safe place for his people, is that God's people will know that God is God. That's comforting. That's peace. That's our source of joy, knowing that God is God, knowing that he is a safe place, a refuge for us. They will know that God dwells among his people on Zion. We know that God dwells among his people as the Holy Spirit present in every believer. And then Joel describes the results of the day of the Lord. He says, the land will be restored to a state similar to the Garden of Eden. Mountains will drip with honey, hills will flow with wine, all the creeks will flow with water, and a spring will go out from the house of the Lord. This spring is described in the book of Zechariah, chapter 14, verse 8. And in that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them towards the eastern sea and the other half towards the western sea, and it will be in summer as well as in winter. Joel mentions that Egypt and Edom will become a wasteland, and I think the reason he does is because of how the people he is writing to would hear this. They would understand the idea of Egypt and Edom becoming a waste as being justice being done. Understand that to them, Egypt and Edom represented bad treatment. These two countries had treated the people of Israel horribly. They needed to know that God is a God of justice. Now, we do know that God will eventually make the entire earth a paradise like Eden when he remakes the new heavens and the new earth. But before that, at some point in time, Egypt and Edom will be a desolate wilderness. Joel concludes this book by stating two things that would be very important to the folks he's writing to. First, he states that Judah and Jerusalem will be eternally inhabited. This is going to be really important to those folks. They just went through a drought, a fire, a locust plague. They're about to go through an invading army and in exile to Babylon. This phrase would be very comforting to the Jewish people for the last 2,000 years. This idea that Judah and Jerusalem would always be inhabited. This is the idea that God fulfills his promises. Second, he tells them that he will avenge the things that had been done and would be done to them. When we consider the history of the Jewish people, we can understand why knowing that God will avenge those who have wronged them is important to them. Now let's understand, Joel writes these things to Jewish people living about 2,800 years ago in the land of Israel. So the question becomes, how does this apply to us? How does any of what he said apply to folks living in the 21st century in Mullen, Texas. What do we do with these things? How should it change what we think or say or do? The point of Scripture is not for us to just memorize facts. The point of God giving us His Word is to change our lives. So what do I change about me from the book of Joel? What do I change based on what Joel has said? Well, the biggest thing I think we should get from this book is that there is, in fact, a great and awesome day of the Lord, and it is coming, and it is certain. 
we get caught up in the locust plagues and the droughts and the fires and the wars and rumors of wars. But all the things we get caught up in are temporary events. God's verdict in the valley of decision is eternally final. This should change how we feel about telling people the gospel, the good news. See, if we've trusted in Christ, we will not be in that valley. But if we know folks who have never trusted in Jesus Christ, they very well might end up in that valley. This ought to motivate us to share the gospel with them. If we really understand this day is coming, it is inevitable, it is certain, then I really ought to tell people how to avoid it. The next thing I think we should learn from this book is that God has it all under control. All of it. I mean, every little thing, he's got it. I need to relax and let him handle it. He deals with the locusts. He deals with the fire. He deals with the drought. He deals with the invading army and the exiles. He deals with the nations and the politics. He deals with the crops, the early rain, the late rain. Did you see anything in this book that God did not have under his control? No, there was nothing. Okay, then why are we stressing out trying to control every little thing around us? That's mostly aimed at me. Maybe you guys don't have that problem, but I do. We need to relax in God's peace and focus on doing God's work, loving one another, forgiving, caring, serving, helping, presenting the gospel, being a light, being salt in the world. These are the things that ought to be our priority. Not the locusts, not the fires, not the wars and rumors of wars. If he can handle locusts and plagues and invading armies, if he can restore Judah and Jerusalem, if he can avenge those who have wronged Israel, well, then he can handle my problems just fine. I don't need to avenge anything. I don't need to stop locust plagues. I need to focus on doing God's work. Not only should we trust that God can handle our problems, we can trust that He will handle them. Because He is a God that loves us and wants an eternal relationship with us even though we all sin. Even though there's nothing we can do about it. Because you see, God can and did do something. He came in the form of a man, Jesus Christ. He lived a sinless life and died on the cross to pay for our sins. He rose again after three days. He ascended to heaven and he is coming back. All we can do, all we're able to do to enter into that eternal relationship is place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior. If there's anybody here who has not placed their faith and trust in Jesus in a moment, I'm going to sing a song. No, I'm going to pray. Y'all are going to sing a song. That would be bad. I'll pray. Y'all sing the song. And if anybody wants to come down during that song, come down and, and trust in Jesus. Come down and talk about baptism. Come down and we'll discuss membership in the church. Come down and I'll pray for you. Father God, you are awesome, mighty, worthy, holy, sovereign, and you do have it all under control. Father, help us to let go of the little stuff and focus on serving you, loving one another, being your hands and feet in this world, forgiving, caring for others. Father, help us to make this not just a Sunday thing, but an every day of the week thing. We thank you for salvation, for the opportunity to serve you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.